Hello, it's Dawn, and this is Dawn Versations. I'm so happy to have you here. We talk about anything and everything. It's just a potpourri of topics, and that's just the way I like it. If you like surprises and you like variety, this is the show for you. Let's go. Welcome to another episode of Dawn Versations. Today we have Sylvia on the show. Welcome, Sylvia. Hi, Dawn. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so happy to have you here. I can't wait for you guys to hear her talk. Her voice is beautiful. Um, (laughs) Sylvia is going to talk to us about emotional intelligence today. Um, I've heard the term many times and I've read random excerpts of books that mention it. But tell me in your words, what is emotional intelligence? So, you know, Dawn, I'm going to give you the more sophisticated version and then the street version that people ought to remember okay (laughs) Okay. just so that we we both sound a little intelligent over here okay so (laughs) um so the the more in-depth version is that it is your ability to recognize and understand your own emotions and the emotions of those around you and then use that awareness to to guide your decisions and your interactions effectively so that's sort of a high level idea but i say that in the simplest form i can put it Emotional intelligence is simply your ability to interact effectively with other humans. That's it. And it's really all the behind the scenes that happens, right? I mean, Dawn, if you think about people that you enjoy being around, people whose presence you you love, people who, when you see their number come across your phone, you want to answer it no matter what you're doing, right? Oftentimes, there's a lot of work they do behind the scenes to be the kinds of people we we crave to be around. And so that's, you know, a lot of that is emotional intelligence, you know, um, in, in no uncertain terms. So it's really our, our ability to interact effectively with other humans. That means people with different personalities, perspectives, viewpoints. How can you interact effectively with others who believe differently, who, who look different, who think differently, you know, and that is yeah. really the crux of EI. Gosh, and that is just huge right now. With we've got our election coming up, right? Oh, like we, there are families that don't speak to one another because of their political differences. Like, how can we all just agree to disagree and let it not yeah. impact our lives? Do you feel like things have changed a lot since things are virtual now? So virtual, like after COVID, you know, not everybody went back to the workplace. A lot of people do just these Zoom kind of things all the time. And even though it's a great um, substitute, do you feel like not interacting in actual person makes any kind of difference as far as emotional connection? I do. I I actually think, um, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking about the fact that we've never been more connected as a global society and yet never more disconnected from each other, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, and in in the sense that we're hiding behind screens, we're, you know, all these algorithms that are sort of tuning in, you know, it's it's interesting. I I watched one video on cancer or something on YouTube and all of a sudden it's like seven videos a day coming in on people who have cancer stories. And it's just, it's really interesting because we do, you know, we live in a society where we are being pushed into these silos, you know, and Mm -hmm. things that are validating what we're already thinking. And so sadly, you know, when COVID first happened and, and I don't know if you remember the weekend, there was a weekend when we had an entire global shutdown. And the only reason I remember it is because I have cousins all over the world, literally in time zones that are 12 hours apart from where I am in DC. And we all got on Zoom and had like a happy hour with wine and beer and whatever, and just caught up for two hours, you know, because nobody went anywhere in the world except yeah. their bedrooms and living rooms, you know? Right. And in those moments, you, 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 we, had, we had an excuse to reconnect with people virtually in the ways that we could. Uh, so when when the pandemic first started and people were you know dying and I think there was a solidarity right globally we were all mm-hmm. like we are in this together as humans against the the whatever this enemy is that is infiltrating our societies right. um, and since you know but I think human nature is we get used to stuff pretty quickly and we have very short term memories and so we, we we went from sort of the closeness that. COVID was creating in terms of look out for your people, reach out. I know a lot of people who had Zoom happy hours all over yeah. and, and we've sort of taken that for granted and it's been replaced by the vitriol. And, it, you know, it's so easy when you are behind screens 
to not see people as human, you mm -hmm. know, and especially in an age where AI is really transforming the landscape. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's all the more reason for us to dig in to our emotional intelligence skills. It really is because it's what separates us from from the robots that are coming you know, yeah. already here. Yeah. And yeah. that's kind of what I was getting at, like EI. And now we got AI, <laughs> like the whole disconnect of things being done for us and everything so robotic and, you know, texting some people's entire relationships are over the phone and texting now. I remember getting yeah. to a point with my husband where I was like, you know what, if we have a conflict, I do not want to do it in text because you yeah. always read it <laughs> in a defensive way, you know? Like, Absolutely. Absolutely. What do you mean? How am I? <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. The, 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 you don't get the tone and all those things that the, the human, the nuances, right, of just being in face-to-face, -face, you know, interactions. And yeah, we're breeding whole societies where kids don't, are losing the skill of just looking at people in the eye and talking yeah. to them as human beings. And that's a little bit, it's sad, but I think it's salvageable, right? And and the, these kinds of conversations that, that we're having, hopefully are uh, landing on, on the ears of people who need to hear. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wrote something down. I probably won't even be able to find it or read my writing. Help people build resilience and, um, with during uncertainty and change. Why do you think it is that people are so, um, they hate change? They don't want, they have such a hard time dealing with change. Why is that? Well, for one, I think um, our brains aren't wired for us. And our brains do not like uncertainty. You know, we're, we're, we're not wired to deal with uncertainty well and change represents uncertainty in our lives. And I, I, I you know, it's often, I, I think that um, when we perceive that a change coming into our lives is going to be good, we tend to embrace it. When we perceive that a change is going to be bad, we resist it. And I'll give an example. Because to me, change is anything that's new, right? That we haven't yet yeah, experienced right. or in, in quite that way. If I gave you um, an all expenses paid trip to the Serengeti, you know, for some safari trip with a friend of yours, right? All expenses paid. Or I gave you the keys to a brand new BMW. Your, the odds are you're probably going to accept both, right? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're If you're like most of us, you probably would accept it. And and, and just let's assume you've never ridden in a BMW before, never driven one, never even seen one, but you know, you, you've heard that it's a luxury vehicle or the Serengeti, the trip you're camping with animals that, are, you know, drinking water and sunset and these beautiful orange black skies and stuff. You're perceiving that this, what you're about to experience is going to be pleasant. And so you fully embrace it. You run with it. You take the car keys before I can even hand them to you. You're gone. Right. But if, if it's a matter of a job change and you're and the, you're going to a new environment where you don't know your coworkers yet and you don't know what your clients are going to be like and you're thinking negatively about that change, you're likely to resist it because your your mind is so focused. You're creating in a present moment a reality that doesn't yet exist, but you framed it in such a negative way. Any human being would resist that, right? If I, yeah. you know, and so I think it's for us to examine how we're talking to ourselves as we're going through that change. Because that is, that's where the power is. You talk about resilience. It's an inside job, you know, mm -hmm. resilience is if it's an, ins it's how do you manage internally what's impacting you or potentially going to impact you, impact you externally that is often out of your control. That is, that's the inside job. Right. And so our self-talk is one of the only things we can control. I call it your monologue, right? The conversations yeah. we have with ourselves about what is happening around us. And if we can take control of that, become more aware of it, we'll realize that we're not having, we're, we're catastrophizing oftentimes. In the midst mm -hmm. of change, I'm catastrophizing about what I think is coming, you know, as opposed to, Either way, we're making up stories. We don't yet right. know what the, on the other side of change, right? And we, but we tend to err on the side of looking at, at negatively how it's going to impact me. Um, I don't think I'm going to survive what's on the other side of this change, and yet we often do. You know, yeah, right. Or we're even happier 
And we're like, wow, why was I pushing so hard against that? Cause it ended up being so great. You know, that self-talk yeah. is crazy because like, I think it's untethered soul, Michael Singer's book, but where he talks about like, um, if a roommate, if you had a roommate or a friend that came over and that was sitting there catastrophizing every single thing that you said, and then be like, you would never want to hang out with that friend. So why do we do that to ourselves? Just sit there and listen to them. <laughs> I, there's times in the shower where I will just go off and I will just be like, wow, how did that just play out in my head for 10 minutes? What in the world? We yeah. got to get that straight. I think that's yeah. the key is just straightening out our own self-talk. It's crazy. Yeah. You know, I did a, I did a keynote um, in 2017 um, for about 500 IT professionals. It was a 90 minute keynote. And I remember waiting deliberately until I was 75 minutes into the presentation. And I looked at the very back of the room because it was sort of standing room only at the back and very sort of deep, narrow room. And I saw two women sitting very comfortably at the back. Okay, it's 15 minutes till we're done. And, and I asked them to transplant themselves from the back of the room, pack up their belongings and make their way all the way up to the front and occupy the two front seats that were empty. Oh. And um, and you can imagine, I know your, your eyes are like getting wide, right? You're imagining <laughs> yourself maybe being in that, being asked right. to do that. And so the, they both get up and start walking to the front, but one of the ladies turned around and just kind of, you know, shy, whatever. And she walked back and sat down. And so the lady who came and sat in the front, I asked her when she, she arrived, I said, ma'am, would you mind telling the rest of us what was going in, in your, on in your head as you were moving yourself from the back to the front of the room? And she, and she looked at me and she said, do you really want to know? We want to know. Right. And so she said, I was thinking, well, why is Sylvia asking us to move? This is no one else is being asked to move. This is so uncomfortable. I've gotten to know my neighbors here, you know, and, uh, and happy hours in 15 minutes because it was <laughs> right after my presentation. And, and unbeknownst to these two women, I had pasted two $100 gift cards underneath the, the two front seats that were empty. And, and so the woman who who came up and sat got it as a reward, right, for being a good sport. But what I said to them at the end of it was that, look, at the end of every uncomfortable change we are asked to endure, my point is not that there's a always going to be a financial reward waiting for us, right? right? But what I was saying is how often are we catastrophizing and having these conversations with ourselves about what is about to happen that often closes the curtain on opportunity because we are just in our minds playing this mental tape that is destructive or is is reaffirming our comfort zones and what we've always known and been familiar with right because the human mind isn't wired for chain uncertainty um i didn't force a lady who sat down to the, sat down the back i didn't force her to to come up to the front you know which is the case in life most times we don't have a gun to our head saying you've got to do this you've got to go with this new company right. you've got to um, and it's, but it was a, it was an eye opener for some people in the audience that, wow, it's interesting because what was the conversation you're having with yourself that then turns, you know, that turns that change into a, a monster, right. you know, instead of something uncomfortable that we've, we, you know, human beings are going to deal with discomfort. Like if we have a life that's guaranteed with no discomfort, then it's the life that is happening under the earth, you know, six feet under, <laughs> right. it's not really happening. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. I yeah. love that. That's such a good lesson that they were dreading going up there and then here's some money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's the conversation. I mean, they were very like, Oh yeah. I was talking very badly in that moment. Like right. there was none of it was the one who came and sat down to that. I said, Oh, well, what the heck I'll what, let me just do it. You know, maybe there's something good in it. This is what she said. Maybe there's some good in it for me, but, um, but most of us don't think that way. We don't think, well, what if there's something better on the other side of this relationship that is, sort of dry and beaten up and you know I'm it's the devil you know versus the the unknown right yeah and, yeah. yeah uh so. so you wrote a book you authored a book I dare you to care and I love that title um but Thank so you. what what there's some strategies in there I believe so mm -hmm. what would be a good practical strategy that people could take away to use because when you were talking about you know, the un uncertainty, I'm thinking of a kid, you know, what would you say to your child? Cause a lot of times kids get scared about things that they're going into and it's scary enough as an adult, but then when you're sitting there trying to talk down a child, like what, what would you, what's a practical way to help a child in uncertainty? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, 
what comes to mind for me, and I actually, this is something I did with um, some actuarial scientists I was presenting to this past Thursday, is um, there's, there's, a, there's a technique, I, I call it an, an emotional intelligence strategy of framing your questions. Okay, so when uncertainty creeps into our lives, you know, um, oftentimes the, the data shows that we tend to default to talking to ourselves in what I'm calling barricading questions, right? These are questions that begin with the word why, typically. And I use the word barricading because I just think about how it, these questions barricade in our thinking and leave us feeling disempowered and helpless about what the uncertainty we're in the midst of. Now, don't get me wrong, there are times when why questions are helpful. You know, if you're a scientist, you wanna drill down why, keep asking mm -hmm. why, I'm not talking about that. But when you're trying to build resilience to face uncertainty, you, your kids, your significant other people in your life, we need to stay away from barricading questions which begin with the word why and rather reframe to asking ourselves what I call gateway questions, which begin with the word how, or what? So gateway questions, the reason I use the word gateway is because I think about how it opens up the gates to forward yeah. thinking. So I'll give you an example. Somebody, you know, is is in a meeting thinking, you know, why why are my ideas never taken seriously? Or why why don't why don't people ever consider my ideas? That's a legitimate question to ask, mm -hmm. but it's very barricading in that it, it gives you no out for how you can even begin thinking about how to be more certain about this uncertain situation. It's a loaded question. I don't know why people aren't taking your ideas seriously. There could be a myriad of reasons. Right. The much more empowering reframe, the gateway question becomes, hey, what one thing can I do creatively to present my ideas for greater impact? So the person who is asking it that way, guess what? They may go to a colleague of theirs down the, the hall who they know has a reputation of really delivering on the ideas and people on the edge of their seats listening. Yeah. And I could say to, to you know, hey, uh, Dawn, what, what's, how, you know, what's the one thing you do to get people to pay attention, to, to make sure people don't interrupt you, blah, 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 mm -hmm. right? But the person who's sitting there thinking, why aren't my ideas taken seriously in meetings? It, you're, it's, you, you see how one just leaves us helpless. Yeah, victim. So, yeah, and and just, so when you're trying to, to manage uncertainty, which is, an ever-present guarantee in our lives, mm -hmm. asking gateway questions of yourself, just orient your mind towards solutions. You know, um, uh, why didn't I get the promotion I deserved? That's loaded. I don't know why, right? But versus, <laughs> you know, how can I um, boost my marketability and skill set? What one thing can I do different? Right? There's, there's so many, you know, why is this, why are tech systems changing? I don't know. How can I use our new tech system to help me do my job even better? So, so you're always looking, you're orienting towards solutions right. with gateway questions. And that really helps us navigate the, the waves of uncertainty in, in, a, in a less torturous way, right? Like turbulence in the plane. You know, you, you, can, you can ride the wave with and have a heart attack at the end because you just were cascading your thoughts and, you know, or you can you can have some discomfort, but get to the end and be like, oh, that was a bumpy ride, but oh, okay. You know what I mean? And you yes. can move on with your day. So somebody has to go into a therapy for a week or something, you know? Right. Yeah. Why why makes you a victim? Whereas yeah. how puts you more in control, puts you back in the Absolutely. driver's seat. What can I do Very to change this? Not mm -hmm. not poor me, poor me. I love that. Uh, were, are you ever scared? Do you used to get butterflies to get up and talk in front of big groups of people? You know, it's a question I, I often get. And and uh, to be honest, at this point, I wouldn't call them. OK, I would call them butterflies, if you say. But I feel like I, I have them in formation, right? Where they sort of take flights, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. The, one of the things really is is if I'm prepared for a presentation, which I will never get on stage without being, um, then, then a lot of the butterflies are not, you know, it's, it's about just, I want to do a good job for them. Right. I also found that oftentimes, cause all of us are going to have to speak publicly at some point. And the reason I say this is because Dawn, you know, I once heard someone say that any speaking that takes place outside the privacy of your own home is public speaking. Well, there right? you go. So yeah. We don't think about it that way. And, right. and so we're all going to have to publicly speak, you know, at, at some point in our lives and, and I think that when we are too self-focused, 
that's when the butterflies are in malformation. You know, if I'm on stage worrying about how I look and how I sound and am I going to make a fool of myself, th then 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 I'm just in a in a mess, right? But if I'm thinking I look forward to a conversation with this audience and I want to be of value to them. And it, when I put it on the audience, there's less for me to be sort of panicking about, assuming I'm prepared. So um, as I mentioned to you, I, I had a presentation on Thursday with about 400 you know, analytical professionals and actuaries at an insurance company. And I've never spoken to actuaries before. So based on their stereotypes about them being more sort of black and white thinkers and you know, their social skills are X, Y, and Z. Right. Um, I thought about it, but I just, um, I listened to, have you ever watched the movie Gladiator? I haven't Gladi seen it. I've seen previews okay. of it and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a long time ago, right? 20 years. But there's right. a song on there by Andrea Bocelli. It's called Nail to, to Mami or something. It's just sort of very anthemy like And, and right. so I would, I put my earphones in and just listen to that and just go into a, another place mentally and then I get on stage and, and you know but the the key is 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 the prep work that I put into it so the butterflies are there but they're they're definitely flying in sync and in a productive way yeah because you know? we can again get in here and worry too much about what everybody is thinking about us as they see us and you know are they critiquing my outfit my hair my clothes whatever um do you think that okay so I know you like tennis do you think that's yes. part of the tennis, the athlete in you that you just get yourself, you practice, 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 and you're prepared. And so when you get out there, you don't worry about anything. You just play the game. Like you know how to play. You know, it's interesting. I feel like you're giving me more credit than I deserve. Uh, Dawn, because, <laughs> just say um, yes, just lie. <laughs> I know, right? I know, I know. I mean, I've been at this for 19 years. So if you look at yeah. my first videos, you probably like, wow, wow, <laughs> Sylvia. Okay. Because yeah, that's, that's the reaction I have. You know, I'm like, oh my God, someone paid me for that. Oh, right. Um, <laughs> so yes, I mean, certainly practice. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, I'm at the point where people make it make it feel like it's second nature for me only because of all the practice I've put in, right? People think, oh, you were born. I was actually a painfully shy young girl growing up. And I'm so glad my mother's still alive to share stories about that because it's sometimes hard for people to believe. But, you know, um, I understand that no great success is going to happen to me in this zone of shyness. So it doesn't serve me to lead with that in, in the world, right? Like, I just need to be the only person who knows how shy I am or at least me and, and all of your listeners now, you know, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So it's just, it's, I love it's, that. Yeah. You know, practice. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's, look, it's, it's such a privilege to be on stage. How often in life do you have moments where people, you have hundreds of people in a room keeping quiet to listen to what you have to say. It doesn't right. happen often. Right. And so it's, it's a privilege I don't take, you know, for granted. And, uh, I think it's what keeps me refining and getting better and better and better and having imposter syndrome from time to time, you know, because um, I think I think that's something that, lead, that stays with us for all of our lives. Because if you care, if you care about being better, if you care about doing more and, and being more from time to time, you're going to have those questions of whether you are feeling um you know, the feelings of inadequacy, we call it uh, pluralistic thinking, you know, uh, sorry, plur pluralistic ignorance, where you think you're the only one who feels this sort of inadequate about you, where you are in your life and, and all of that. But yeah, we just keep, you know, plodding along. Um, so how you know, do it's you deal with that? How do you deal with that when you get, because we all do it, but there's somebody in particular, I'm not going to say who it is in my mind that <laughs> always thinks that some people must be talking bad about me if they're talking so you know and it's not an egotistical kind of way at all it's in a paranoid self you know insecure way how do you get out of there of that thinking of if people are talking it's got to be about me or you know that that how do you get out of that yeah I mean I think okay I'm gonna answer this sort of twofold I think one comes back to what we've been talking about which is minding your monologue you know I tell my audiences all the time you know you've got to stop at times and say am I minding my monologue like literally I sometimes have cat cat catastrophizing thoughts you know because I'm human and I stop and I say Sylvia are you minding your monologue you know and I, I sort of laugh with myself because that's all we need is just to catch the, yes. the mental which is so familiar to you. It's so familiar when we talk down to ourselves, right? We don't even know we're doing it because it's so familiar, you know? And, and um, one of the things I often talk about is, is this idea of expensive stories. You know, we, we have this narrative going on in our heads about 
things happening around us. And I stop and see, you know, how expensive is your story? Because you, if you focus on not the story itself, because that's so familiar to you, it belo- it's in your skin, it's part of who you are, even if it's not serving you, what's much more important to focus on is the cost. So what is it costing me to continue to hold on to this narrative that other people are talking about me, you know, in an, in a, in a negative light? What is it costing me? It's costing me. And I, I, I invite my audiences to write this down, especially my women audiences, write it down. Maybe it's costing me friendships. It's cost me the opportunity to go for, for things I know I deserve, be, you know, cause I've already talked myself out of it because I saw people talking and I, you know, and I think when we focus on the cost, it makes it much easier to stop that 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 expensive narrative because it's almost like you're horrified like wow it's costing me all these five things right you know most of us focus on the story because it's so familiar it's the devil you know but it's like i don't know any better i don't know any differently yeah. but if the energy is focused on the cost that you have articulated yourself it's like, oh no, I need a new story. I need a much more empowering story. So every time I see people talking about me, I'm not, I'm not gonna default to, they must be denigrating me. I'm gonna say, maybe they're interested in knowing me more, right? Like right. That's, that's the work we do behind the scenes. And, and you know, I often say emotional intelligence is not a skill set we need when our lives are perfect, when our relationships are firing on all cylinders. We need our EI skills most for the challenging, uncomfortable, and inconvenient moments of our lives. That is a reason f- to build it, to acquire those skills, to get, you know, yeah, to get better at it. That gave me goosebumps. I love that so much. So you, d- did you work under Maya Angelou or? Um... I, well, I was mentored, I guess you could say that, right? Because I was at her feet often, <laughs> literally. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, I was, I, I had the, the opportunity really, I wouldn't call it a rare opportunity because I'm sure she mentored a lot of other women. Um, but yeah, I, I, she was, she was an instrumental part of my mid, mid twenties to mid thirties, you know? And um, yeah, I just 13 years of, of soaking her all in and some of those earlier years of just being so starstruck and, and not really fully present whenever I was around her. But yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I mean, I had a chance to spend time with her in Harlem in her home. And it's interesting because she she extended things to me before she even knew, knew who I was, you know? And, and, and it wasn't until she passed away that I really sat down to think about why, you know, at 20, I met her when I think I was about 24, you know? And I was just like, why, why did she want to help me? Like she didn't, you know, she didn't know much about me other than me introducing myself to her at the restaurant while I was waiting tables, you know, and then oh. before I knew it. Yeah. So that's really how it began, you know? Oh, um, how neat. Yeah, yeah She yeah. seemed like such a beautiful person inside and out, yeah. but you hear her speak yeah. and everything she said sounded like a poem, even if it was just a sentence, it just yeah. flowed out of her mouth. It's just like, yeah. Oh, we need a million more of her. I'm glad you got yeah. that ex- opportunity. I mean, really. That's amazing. Yeah, it, was, it was even even in meeting her the first time, and you know, I, my friend was bartending, and and I just wanted to be introduced to her very quickly, get back to my section, take care of my lunch customers, and and I go to her and um, just said, Dr. Angelo, lovely to meet you. Just want to let you know how how much I admire your work, and I'm like prepared to turn around and start walking back to the dining room, and. And she's like, very, well, very nice to meet you, young lady. And then, you know, that sort of deep, resonant, yes. regal voice. And then she starts asking me about myself and what do I want to do beyond waiting tables? And 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 then it just, you know, and then I said, I, I was starting out as a life coach at the time. This is like 22 years ago. And, and, um, and she said, do you have a business card? And I always had them in my apron. That's a little, you know. For, for all the people waiting tables out there, you know, I always had a business card in my apron and she says, um, well, go and get it for me because I'm going to give it to someone. And if they call you, it may be the best thing that ever happened to you. And I was gone before she was done talking. And um, it's interesting because <laughs> it, it took two years, right? I was thinking to myself, well, you know, who is this person she wants to hook me up with? And she barely knows me, you know, and it took a couple of years for me to find out. Um, and it, it happened when I went to see her in Harlem. Um, I just wanted to ask her a simple question over the phone and her travel companion, Miss uh, Lydia Starkey, lovely lady, and we're still very close friends. Um, 
I thought she was going to go and get Dr. Angelo to come and just answer my quick question over the phone because they were in Winston-Salem at the time in North Carolina. And Ms. Taki puts the phone down and then I hear her footsteps sort of going in the distance and she comes back and she's like, doctor wants to see you in Harlem next week. And I was like, that, you know, what am I going to do? You know, so long story short, I got my little broke self on the uh, DC to New York China bus <laughs> and the whole four hour ride. I'm just like, what, what are you doing, Sylvia? Like, what are you going to say to this woman when you get there? Like, you know, it's yeah. all of a sudden the question I had for her felt so trivial. Like I even forgot what I wanted to ask her, you know? And <laughs> so, um, yeah. So when I got there and Miss Taki invited me into her really inviting warm home with all those earth tone colors, just the way you imagine my Angela's home would be. And, and she's waiting for me in the, in the basement sun, sun kiss kitchen, just beautiful yellow walls and lots of light coming in. And, mm. and she's sitting there with a glass of white wine and gives me two hours of her time uh, uninterrupted. And then she wow. picked up the phone and uh, called her agent, who's the person she had thought about, you know, to, 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 to connect me with. And, uh, David Lacamara. And the, the, the point was that this is somebody who was booking celebrity speakers, you know, people who were making tens of thousands of dollars on keynotes. And I was nowhere, nowhere near that just, you know, at the time. And I, it took me a while to understand why she did that. Because like, why would you hook me up with, with your agent who's booking a bunch of celebrities? And I think at the end of the day, my Angelo was, she loved the youth. She loved the people coming behind her. And, and I think she obviously saw in me what, I didn't get to see myself for many years, you know, until it's almost like she believed in me until I, I caught up, you know, with, with that Aww. myself. And, and um, yeah, so she, she, you know, the whole um, quote that she's known by the, the one that she, that says people will forget what you said. Yes. People forget what you did. They'll never forget how you made them feel. I mean, I, I saw that firsthand and the thing she, the thing I love the most about her, you know, with her Thanksgivings, having lots of celebrities in them, you would see them around her, whether it was Oprah or Steven Spielberg. I mean, they, they just were all very, very humble. Like she she had no no patience for celebrities who elevate themselves on a pedestal. And she would tell me all the time, she says, Ms. Balfour, you never elevate people on the pedestal because when you do that, the youth coming behind have nothing to aspire to because everybody is so special in the clouds, you know? Wow. And so she was... She lived it out. She 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 absolutely did dis dislike celebrities getting too big for their britches. Is that the the expression? Yeah, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And she wow. would she would let you know. I mean, it's also the reason why I didn't know she spoke nine languages until I I spent time interviewing her and and I um you know speak in Debele, which is is a language from Zimbabwe with the clicks like the you know like Amakanda's eggs and and she spoke Kosa, which is you know sort of foundational to Debele. And off camera in, in the B-roll, we totally were having a conversation in, in, you know, and she was clicking and her accent was amazing. She spoke Italian fluently and, um, you know, my, my husband's from Paraguay and we went to Thanksgiving together, you know, one year and she's speaking better Spanish than he was, you know, and, and, and her whole thing was, if another human being has spoken this language before, then why can't I, you know, and, and she really believed that, you know, and. She had sort of a, a Latin expression that she would say to to equate to that that rationale, but yeah, it was she was just very impressive, and I still pinch myself, you know. Um, yeah. That it. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, she was just amazing. That's phenomenal. That is actually just mind blowing. I mean, because of course she didn't paint herself to be like worship me. I'm a big deal, but she was a big deal, and that's so cool that you got to experience that, especially as a young person meeting yeah. her, you know, right when you yeah. needed it. It's funny how people come into your life right when you need them to. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's an important reminder, you know, the whole concept of who are you when you think no one is watching. I mean, it was just the fact that I worked that lunch shift, right? I mean, the trajectory of my life for those 13 years were changed by me being at lunch that day to work a shift. I didn't work every lunch, right? And so it's, but in, in those happenstance moments of our lives, which we call living, we, we need to always be mindful because people are, she always said to me, people are always watching, you know? And in fact, I did an interview with her that's on YouTube and there's one clip where she talks about that because with kids and social media and how like your reputation is imprinted forever and, you know, people, and she talked about her, one of her eyes was sort of, moving astray and she just sort of it was an interesting story she shared but she was you know one to remind me people are always watching and so clearly she saw something 
that day at the cigar bar in the restaurant when I said hi to her and I could have you know so it's not to say we shouldn't emote and show like when you're having a bad day yeah you're supposed to feel the range of emotions that are meant for us as human beings to feel right. but oftentimes we're not so mindful of how we're moving through this world which is which is my passion for the work I do in emotional intelligence is just helping people be more mindful of the way they're moving through this world because there's so much available to us when we can just allow ourselves to be the best versions of ourselves as often as possible. You know, we don't have to mope all day. Yeah, we have ups and downs and losses mm -hmm. and grief and all of that. But in between, you know, are, are you, I often say, you know, are you someone who, do people crave your presence or do they crave your absence? You know, and um, yeah, I think of that a lot, you know. Gosh, yeah. I could seriously sit and listen to you for like 10 hours. I can see why you're a speaker. The way you word things is magical. Are you going to write another book or? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm i feeling the pressure <laughs> to do it. And speaking about <laughs> writing books, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that in 2025, I will, I will do one. Um, one of the things my Angelo often told me, you know, she'd, I'd ask about her writing because she, she would write continuously for eight hours sometimes. And at the end of the eight hours, she would find that she could only keep one sentence. And she said, Ms. Baffour, easy reading is damn hard writing. And I never forgot that until I wrote my book did I really understand what she meant that when you have a book that is enjoyable to read, it probably was damn hard writing for the author right. on the other end. You know? Yeah, that's a big deal oh, yes. to write a book. That's a huge, uh, huge deal. A lot, a lot of um, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't think of it. It's not coming to me, but you just really have to have a lot of patience to sit yeah. and yeah. fail a few times before you get it just yeah. right. And yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, give yourself some grace, you know, it's, we're so critical of ourselves and that's what stops us from those ideas flowing when we keep critiquing and that's not good enough. And, and that's what I was doing for a while, you know, so yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're just, we're just trying to figure out this life, you know, and navigate it the best way we can. You know? Yeah. Well, I love what you're doing. I love it. Tell people how they can find you. Are you on social yes. media at all or? I, I am. I'm, I'm mostly on uh, LinkedIn and Instagram. So Sylvia Balfour on LinkedIn, Instagram. I think you can find me by Sylvia Speaks with an S-Y-L. Um, yeah. And yeah, Sylvia Speaks or on Instagram and LinkedIn. I'm less on the other platforms, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I, yeah, I welcome, I welcome. And if, if anyone reaches out, just please let me know that you were listening in on uh, Donversations and, uh, yeah, we'll connect and any questions you might have, I'm more than happy to answer them. I love it. Thank you so, so, so much for taking the time to be here and to talk to me. And nobody knows this, but Sylvia didn't know that we were going to record today. <laughs> I surprised her a little bit. So you really, thanks for being a sport and um, going ahead with it. I really, your words are just magic. I just, I can't wait to air this. I love it. And it's going to help oh. so many people. I just know it. Well, it helped me. So <laughs> you've got one person that it helped. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Dawn. It's been a privilege and a, a, a treat and a pleasure. And, and hopefully your listeners will indeed get something meaningful from this conversation. They will for sure. I appreciate it. And I will be in touch. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, please give it a like. And if you have not yet subscribed, subscribe. Have you subscribed yet? Please do. I'd love to have you on board. And if you have any ideas, suggestions, input, leave it in the comments below. Have a good day.